Welcome to the Bird Podcast. I'm Shobha Narayan. This episode features Dr. Vivi Robin, who does cutting edge research on bird diversity using genetics with many surprises. You can see his work at skyisland.in. In this episode, Dr. Robin will talk about understanding the patterns and processes of ecology, evolution, and biogeography using island systems. Dr. Robin is an associate professor at the Indian Institute of Science, Education, and Research in Tirupati. He has been a National Geographic Explorer, a Fulbright Fellow, and a Salim Ali Lokwan Tho Ornithological Fellow. Welcome, Dr. Robin, and thank you. Yeah, thank you, Shobha. Great, great to uh, have uh, to be here. Yeah, thanks. So, uh, please tell us a little bit about your work, which is how we usually start on the podcast. Sure, sure. So um, I study birds uh, and birds are the model system that I use uh, to understand how uh, nature is uh, kind of working in some sense. Uh, the, the window that uh, is provided to me is through these tools, genetics and bioacoustics. I, I primarily use two uh, specific tools and I try to understand how birds, especially on mountains, uh, that are isolated from each other, uh, how, how they are impacted by the fact that they are isolated. So how does isolation uh, affect them? Is there impacting their gene flow? And has this been happening for a long enough period that you have new species? Or is it fairly recent um, that probably there is uh, a lack of gene flow, but uh, you know they, they, they are not different species? And that's where the bioacoustics tools come in because uh, they, they you have these culturally transmitted traits. I, we can talk about that more. But the point is that songs of birds, which uh, which we kind of uh, know from the time when we wake up in the morning and things like that, these songs differ just like human languages. So that provides additional insights uh, to how birds uh, kind of you know talk to themselves. Let's say. Isolated populations have more different songs than populations that are connected. Yeah. Wow. We did an episode with Dr. Samira Agnihotri on bird song, but that was um, uh, linked to yeah. Chamraj Pet and how the uh, uh, dwell the local people there talked about bird song in their own languages. Yeah. So that was very yes. interesting. But you're saying your thesis is that isolated populations of birds develop unique patterns of song. Is that what you're saying? Yes, yes. So this is uh, not something that um, it's not something that we found. Uh, this is uh, this is known uh, globally. People have uh, documented this from the 1970s, um, essentially from the time when um, the recorders, uh, you know, the technology to record audio and analyze it. Uh, from that point onwards, people have been looking at how the songs are are, differ, are different. Different people have been kind of examining that in other parts of the world. It's just that in India, we've kind of, uh, there are some pioneers who've done that previously, but, uh, uh, you know, our group looks very specifically on mountains, on these isolated populations. So that's uh, that's what we do. So the person who introduced you to us, uh, Gautam John, told us that you do cutting edge research on biodiversity using genetics with surprising results or many surprises. So tell us what yeah. the surprises are. Why did he say that? Yeah, yeah. so I think that uh, the surprises are mostly because um, a lot of the taxonomy, you know, the how we how we understand biodiversity and that is by using these uh, ideas of species. And uh, the way we understand species is from, uh, uh, you know, people who've, who've done this work as taxonomists, and they've used tools of, of the time. So 100 years back, basically, they had a set of tools that uh, they had to kind of explore this. But today, we have very different set of tools. Now, the problem with understanding biodiversity today is that if we depend on the tools from 100 years back, then the insights that we get are a little bit limited. So uh, the surprises are only because I use some genetic tools, uh, which allows us to understand um, how evolution has progressed, which may be different from just the appearance-based uh, uh, groupings of 
organisms, which is what we call species uh, largely today. So the genetic data is what provides those insights. Um, I can pro I can give an example if you if you like. Yes, please. Yeah. So the the main species that I worked on the white bellied uh, shulakili that's what it is called now. It used to be called the short wing. Uh, so it's a drab little blue bird. I mean, nobody knows about the bird too much. It's found in the forest understory. When I started working on the bird, there were very few records of the species. And uh, many people said, yeah, you know, this is not something that you're going to see very much. But uh, it turned out that uh, the species was found only on the tops of the mountains. So you have to go really up on the Western Ghats on the higher elevations. That's where you find them. But then if you go, so you're in Anamalais uh, and you go to one side of the mountain and you see a version which just has a white belly. And then you get down the hill and go across to the Nilgiris on the other side, other side of the Palghat Gap. And you see another one which has a rufous uh, belly, which is a slightly orangish uh, color on the belly. And um, at the time when I was working on it, it was thought to be a subspecies. There were I, ideas that people thought it's so small, the difference between these birds and the colors are so small that probably they're not very different species. And ad in addition to that, people also thought it was a short wing. And that's a group of birds found in the Himalayas. Now, once we had the genetic data, it turned out that um, the these birds are nowhere similar to the short wings. And this happens often. It's called convergent evolution. Um, and I think we learn of it in school, uh, where you say the bats and birds both have the same kind of wings. Uh, and that is because of convergent evolution. But this was that happening right in front of us uh, in the sense that, um, you know, there were two birds that uh, appeared similar, but they are nowhere related. Uh, and so we had to kind of create a new uh, genus to kind of place the species. And we said, okay, so this is this has its own kind of a space. Uh, it's very different from several million years about 10 to 11 million years different from the other uh, short wings. So which is why it's now called Sholikola. That's the, gen uh, the genus name. And that's the first part. The second part is that every mountain seemed to have a different species. <clears throat> so even across the Anamalais and the Nilgiris, um, these birds uh, were different by about 5 million years. And that's actually a very, very large uh, time frame if you consider, you know, human evolution and other organisms, which is, you know, humans are two million years. I mean, tigers are under a million year, and so on. So, um, so that's that's the that's the context of uh, what we found. And this was not just in uh, this species. There were other species also, like the laughing thrush. <clears throat> now it's called the chilapan or the monte sincla, uh, the scientific name they also had this pattern where species are found on each of these different mountains in the Western Ghats, uh, but they are different species. Uh, so they were thought to be one species. They turned out to be four different species uh, on these mountains. So the surprising part is that people have been birding uh, in the Western Ghats for the longest times. And the birds are probably one of the best known species. So there was a whole, you know, two new genus and, you know, uh, the seven different species that were there uh, that was not described. And it was only because of the tools that we used that we found these. So that was a surprising part, actually. Sorry, um, it's a long answer. Yeah. No, no, it, it's very interesting. The one thing I didn't understand was you said that they are different in uh, five million years, you said? Yeah. So, so it takes 5 million years for them to evolve from one mountain to the other mountain species. Is that what that means? Um, you could look at it that way, but the, the, uh, the, the actual technically correct way to say this would be that they've been isolated for so long. And, um, uh, you know, in the process, maybe one and a half million, two years apart, two million years apart, they would have turned into different species. So today they don't recognize each other. That's the main thing. And wow. um, yeah, very frequently people ask me, how do you know this? Did you try, you know, introducing one bird to another? 
and do they uh, do they mate uh, and that's again a very um, it's a it's a valid question uh, because our ideas of species are based on some of these early concepts of uh, species and this one particularly is called biological uh, species concept so people who understand that ask this question like do they when they when when they meet can they mate with each other uh, so today that's not a very valid uh, like because our understanding of what is a species has changed substantially but there is a way you can actually answer this question uh, with the technology that's available today uh, previously you would have to bring these birds together but today you just have to play the song of one bird to another and you can assess uh, because this is a dark forest understory um, so the the way a bird responds to another how they find mates is largely through these acoustic signatures um, you know they they listen to uh, they listen for their kind and they respond uh, and in this case uh, you know they don't respond so that's uh, uh, so you know that you know they they really don't see each other as the same species either so i was going to ask you the answer to that question do they mate but i think you provided the answer is that they if they don't recognize yeah. each other's songs then clearly they they'll ignore each other if they are brought together or something that's right that's right yeah and we've not done that specific physical bringing together exercise but uh, many people have done that in other parts of the world where the songs are very different and you introduce the birds together most often they don't uh, they don't mate but you know, if you if you look at it, that's one way to look at it. The other way is that for five million years they've been isolated, because the you know you may ask why are they isolated? Because these mountains are right next to each other. <clears throat> on a clear day, if you're kind of standing on one of these hills, you may even be able to see the other hill. Uh, but um, the point is that these birds are specialized to a certain kind of climate. Uh, a certain habitat and climate combination, let's say, which is found only on the top of that mountain. So if they come down, the climate and habitats are so different that it might as well be an ocean. So they they just don't come down. Uh, and the the time that they did come down was when the climate changed. So or they can only move down when the climate changes and brings you know that habitat down and it's connected between the two mountains. So which is why uh, these types of mountains and the habitats on top of the mountains are called sky islands. But I, did, I, I was going to say, forget coming down. They don't think to fly. Birds can fly everywhere. Uh -huh. They don't think to fly across from one mountain yeah. to another. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah, that's okay. also a very uh, good question. Uh, in fact, I get asked this uh, very, very uh, frequently. And that is also, again, because of our perception of how birds fly. And uh, the way we think birds fly is, um, uh, you know, they just go uh, straight, like as they say, the, as the crow flies, like straight, straight from point A to point B. Uh, but there are some birds that do that, but not all birds do that. So many of them fly, let's say, clamped to the ground, as you could, as you might say, which means that if you have a, a uh, hill, it would go, you know, it, it flies like close to the ground. So yeah, it's not going to just go straight. So that depends on the ecology, let's say, and behavior of these species. So understory birds, which have short round wings, uh, they particularly um, don't uh, fly, you know, in that direct uh, kind of straight manner. Um, and uh, there's a very nice a uh, scientific study where uh, people working in South America actually looked at the uh, proportion of, you know, the length of the primary feathers versus the secondary. So if your primary is longer than the secondary, then you end up with a pointed uh, wing. And those birds can, can fly, you know, far and long distances. But birds with rounded wings where the primaries and secondaries are kind of similar, it ends up having a very similar rounded wing, uh, like babblers and several understory birds, and those don't fly very very far. So huh. yeah, it's a, this is that's a, it's amazing. Behavior. 
Yeah, yeah. And you know, the tagline for our bird podcast, which is what we used to say that we, we find experts all over the world is we say, birds don't have any borders and neither do we. But you've just said birds have borders, not only borders, they have specific mountains that they like <laughs> or yes, understories yes. that they like. So this is a, and being clamped to the ground is a very, I mean, it's an interesting concept that this is why they don't fly from one mountain to the other, because the, the I'm guessing they don't find the same kind of e ecology or what they need in the next mount, or they don't know that. So they don't attempt it. Yeah. Yeah. They, they don't know that. I think that's possibly the, uh, yeah. Huh. The words, no. Yeah. When uh, when people describe you, they uh, the term they use is that you work in the Shola forests. And I've heard this and everybody says Shola forests are very important. But can you explain why they are important? Yeah. So I think um, this is, um, it's, um, uh, uh, you know, the Shola forests are found only on the Western Ghats and only in the Southern part of the Western Ghats, which are higher mountains. And it's only on the tops of these mountains. So it forms this uh, habitat type called tropical montane cloud forest. So cloud forest because, you know, the, the clouds are often hitting the hills and they actually get a lot of their water from directly from the clouds hitting those, uh, uh, those hills. Uh, so they're very wet and it's also fairly cold. Uh, and it's a, it's a kind of a feature of uh, these tropical coastal mountains that this wetness uh, gets kind of, um, is very stable. <clears throat> so those areas are very climatically stable uh, over time. So which means that species that have um, kind of, that, that are adapted to those habitats, they survive for really long periods of time. <clears throat> Because in the other areas, as the habitats change with climatic fluctuations, uh, some species may go extinct. Um, so, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. So, uh, one way to look at it is that the Shula forests in the Western Ghats, they host uh, some of the oldest birds of the Western Ghats. Uh, the Sholikola and the Laughing Thrush we talked about. Uh, they happen to be the oldest of the, you know, passerine birds in the Western Ghats. Uh, and that's probably because the Shola habitats uh, have remained quite stable for a long period of time. So there's unique biodiversity. And of course, I'm giving you a perspective from the birds, but um, uh, there are several other uh, uh, researchers who worked on frogs, on, you know, other uh, amphibians and snakes. They find very similar patterns. So the Shola habitat is uh, unique because uh, it's a very unique climatic, uh, uh, climatically stable space, which has a unique habitat, which hosts a lot of biodiversity, uh, whether it's plants, insects, birds, reptiles, pretty much everything. And why are they under threat? Um, I think the, the most important point is that they are very small. So it's almost, it's uh, like an island, you know, we, I, I say sky islands. So most of the island fauna, most of the island species today we know are under threat because the total area available to them is very little. So should something happen to that uh, area, then these species are lost. So the biggest threat is the fact that there's not much space. Um, and uh, climate change is something that is very serious. Of course, even for the best known species, uh, which is the birds from the Western Ghats, we have very little historic data uh, to assess how these bird communities have changed. And uh, I have I have a, a group of colleagues who have uh, looked at historic data where Salim Ali had gone and done some surveys. They did resurveys of some of those areas. And they found that some species have actually disappeared and some other species have gone up the mountain. So uh, presumably this is what is happening um, all, all across. Uh, we simply don't have long-term long ecological monitoring uh, or these long-term ecological observatories as, as they are known globally. 
uh, the Ministry of Environment started this program, uh, but it's not it's not gone as far ahead as we would have thought uh, uh, it would have. But at least we have we have the ideas in place and a mechanism in place to kind of monitor this uh, in the future. So there's much to be done. I watched a film, um, Save, Save Our Shola Grasslands by Prasanjit Yadav. And uh, the uh, c conclusion was quite surprising. Or And in some of the articles under the very nice media section on skyisland.in, it, they basically say leave it alone is is one of the recommendations. Like all the stuff has happened now. Instead of regaining the grasslands, replanting and changing everything, just leave it alone because the sholas will come back. They are very hardy. Is that am yeah. I am I correct in summarizing that? Uh, so I have to kind of uh, provide some nuance to this. Yes. Uh, yes. When we say uh, shola habitat it actually has two kinds of habitats in it. One is a forest and the other is a grassland. So this is a biphasic kind of habitat, which means that, uh, you know, both the forest and grassland occur together uh, in a mountain. So if you are going to, uh, you know, Nilgiris or let's say Ereviculum, you'd see that there are forest patches, but there's also large extents of grasslands yes. uh, where Nilgiri tar and things like that are seen. Um, now the prop, like the problem is that most of us grew up thinking of conservation as forest conservation, and so did I. Uh, so our approach to conservation is uh, related to how the habitat is changing, but for the forest side of things, not the grasslands. And what's happened, uh, unknown to many, is that uh, the grasslands have been taken over by these exotic timber species which we had um, planted for something else, you know, acacia, eucalyptus, and pine, they actually went rogue. They escaped the plantations and they have taken over large areas, even up to 60% of some areas. So in some places, there are no grasslands at all. Uh, it's all become woodlands. So the, uh, what's happened there is that the grassland species like the Nilgiri pipit have actually disappeared. So we think that there is some local extinction of some of these birds, uh, but the forest species are doing okay. So, uh, and at least uh, we did some analysis with uh, remote sensing imageries, and we find that forests have not been lost as much. It's the grasslands that have been lost. So yes, uh, forests, you can kind of, you know, just let them be and they are doing fine, but grasslands are a different matter altogether. Because if you do not contain these rapidly, you know, invading uh, areas, we'll actually end up losing all the grasslands and there would be no space for Nilgiri pipit uh, to exist. In fact, uh, Nilgiri pipit is probably one of the most restricted range species uh, that we have in the Western Ghats. Uh, it's found only on two hills um, and most of those hills are gone. So, so I think there's a lot uh, of urgent conservation action that's needed with the grassland aspect, but not the forest. You know, uh, this question we come to again and again, our first episode was on the Great Indian Bustard, where we went to the Desert National Park and talked, and the rangers there told us, unfortunately, the bustard is a very specialized bird, like perhaps the Nilgiri pipit. There are certain birds that adapt better than others and they thrive with all the stuff that humans grow, but Nilgiri. So now we come to the bird aspect. So what's special about the Nilgiri pipit and why should be? Yeah, and, yeah. Nilgiri pipit is also one of those birds that are, you know, evolutionarily very distinct. Uh, they have also been in this landscape for several million years. Um, uh, so, uh, so this is the only place where it's found and it's not found in the neighboring mountains. Like, you know, it's only found in the Nilgiris and Anamalai, these two hills and Western Ghats, you know, have other, other hills as well, but the Nilgiri pipit's not found there. And that's possibly because those, the peaks of those mountains are just not as tall as the Nilgiris and Anamalais. So the highest... Highest peaks are at, you know, the Anemudi in the uh, 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 Arabiculum area. And then you have, you know, Dordabita and all those others in the Nilgiris. And uh, these are 
you know, 2,400, 600, you know, the, the, the areas about 2,000 meters um, are, uh, are these places where the Nilgiri pipit really thrives well. About 1,800 is what our analysis uh, kind of shows. Uh, sometimes it occurs a little bit lower, but not, not as much. So elevationally speaking, uh, Nilgiri pipit is the most restricted range uh, species. Uh, we could kind of, you know, we don't have the data to do so, but you could assume that possibly it's gone extinct from the lower hills. It may have been found in the other lower hills earlier, but they are no longer there. Um, so that's that kind of, uh, you know, make you uh, really think about what may be happening to uh, some of these species, because I already said that landscape change is happening very fast. So native pipit is a species then that is threatened not just by, uh, you know, landscape change, but also climate change. So this, this, is, a, uh, this is a real uh, issue for the species. So that's what's going wrong for, for the species. It's highly specialized and it has nowhere to go. Yeah. I went yeah. to Bayanad and the Banasura laughing thrush also apparently is only in higher elevations and it has they have nowhere to go. And I always think to ask conservationists and researchers so how where do you stand on losing one species because it is so specialized and it doesn't adopt adapt. But I don't know if that's a whole different subject matter. Yeah. I don't know if you want to get into it or just Yeah, it's difficult. It's difficult. Uh, that's um, uh, I mean yeah, I I think it's it's very complicated. Yeah, losing species yes. is not easy, especially if there are trade offs. Yeah. So moving on to the shola kili or the sholi kola, uh, which is uh, another bird that uh, I mean, your website is a wonderful resource for all the magnificence of this bird. But for those who have not read all the matter, tell us about this bird uh, and why it's so wonderful, actually. <laughs> yeah. So um, this is a species which is wonderful, not because, I mean, uh, I may be biased, but uh, uh, in that I, I think it's uh, it's an amazing bird. But uh, actually, if you was, were to step back and look at this bird, there's really nothing spectacular about it. Uh, it's just a dull blue bird. Uh, it's skulks in the understory. Uh, most people don't even spot it. Uh, but it really comes to life. Uh, when you listen to it sing and it has a absolutely amazing song and this is the first thing that kind of captivated me um and uh you know i've been working now on the species for uh, 24 years i would say uh and we've been adding pieces of information about the species Initially, it was just where is it found, but slowly we started looking at, you know, like I was saying, the genetic differences and the song differences. And now we have uh, collaborators and students who are really very bright. They come from very interdisciplinary fields. And there are some who um, actually know a lot of uh, physics and math and modeling, and they're able to kind of uh, uh, look at the species with a very different lens. For example, one student, Suyash, uh, he decided to, uh, uh, you know, actually some way challenge us. He, he kept saying, you know, you, you guys keep saying that this bird has a very complex song, but what do you mean by this? I mean, how do you measure this? How do I take your word on it? And he went on to kind of um, uh, create an index of how to measure song complexity. So it's a mathematical formula that lets you assess how complex uh, the song of a bird is and then once he was done with it he said let me then now look at all the literature of other birds across the world that people think have complex songs and let's see where the sholikola uh, you know stands and as it turned out at least with the measure that he has sholikola has one of the most complex songs um, uh, in from what we know so it's a it's a fascinating bird, and we have color bands on these birds, so we know individuals. So once we know individuals, it really puts a very different perspective uh, to our understanding of wildlife. It's uh, the uh, I, I I don't know what is a good analogy, but you can say I like dogs, but uh, you have one dog in your house, 
and you have a special bond with it. That's because you can identify that individual. Uh, and similarly, you know your neighbor's dog or you know you know the dog which is very friendly to you. You know it's a different personality. So you, you are able to add other uh, traits or values or something uh, to all of these individuals. That's exactly what we do as scientists as well. Once we know the individuals, we can add data to these individuals. And then that lets us analyze this a little bit more to understand what, you know, what are the interactions between these individuals. And it turns out that despite the Sholikola having such a complicated song, they have some rules of sharing songs between individuals that are very similar to um, human language sharing. So this really kind of blew our minds, you know, it's like, wow, how is this bird doing something so complicated? So, so the bird is uh, fantastic, not because of how it looks, but because of what it does and where it is. And uh, yeah, it's just, it's just fantastic. We've been watching this bird for a long time and the insights that we've kind of got from this is uh, fantastic. So, yeah. Yeah, uh, people interested in this should go to the publication section of skyisland.in. I think the study that Dr. Robin was referring to is called the Song Richness Index uh, 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 study that S, S, Savant S, and then there's a yes. spectrogram cross, -co cross correlation for complexity of bird vocalizations. Also, lead researcher uh, Savant S. I don't know if those are the ones you were talking That's the about. One. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. So I'm reading out something, Dr. Robin, which I read about you. Uh, you've studied 23 species of birds to understand how the sky islands and their physical barriers to gene flow have affected the bird distribution. Can you talk about this, please? So this was a follow, uh, follow on from our pre preliminary understanding of what was happening with the Sholikola, which was that these birds had these, uh, you know, they were isolated on different mountains. Uh, so the question that we had, this was with when I was with Dr. Umar Ramakrishnan's lab in NCBS. Uh, and what we were thinking was if the if one species had this pattern, what if we look at the entire community of birds? Maybe there are more birds that are, you know, not able to cross these barriers. And that's when we decided to target the uh, larger community of birds. And we found, again, more surprises that, uh, you know, several species were actually... Uh, let's say, impacted by this uh, barrier. And biogeographic barriers are where uh, a lot of species turnover happens, which means that uh, uh, there's a physical point on one side of which you have a particular species and it doesn't cross that. And there are a new set of species on, on another side. And Palghat Gap happens to be one such barrier. So biogeographic barrier means it is more important. It's what we talked about, the bird not able to fly across the mountain, that be, right. not because of geographical constraints, but biological constraints. If now I'm slowly understanding. Yeah, but it's a combination, actually. It could be a combination of reasons why they are not able to cross. Uh, but the point is that they, they simply do not, whatever be the reason. Uh, and um, that has implications for diversity because which means that there's a new set of species on the other side. So the better we understand the distributions of these fine scale distributions of these species, better our knowledge of biodiversity is. So mm -hmm. biodiversity knowledge is intricately linked to biogeography uh, mm -hmm. in this manner. Otherwise, um, uh, you know, initially, I think Palghat Gap being a barrier was uh, proposed by uh, Dr. Vidya, TNC Vidya was working on elephants and it was really surprising at that point that uh, elephants are not able to cross this uh, uh, this barrier and then you know data from other organisms started coming in and uh, it turned out that there are several species that are not able to cross this barrier and so now we know it as a biogeographic kind of a paradigm uh, when it's true for many species. And in layman's terms, the reason they are not able to cross is because the food or the things available to them on their side is not available on the other side and they've figured that out? No, that can be one of the reasons, but um, uh, the, the, the reasons can be very, very complicated. It can be historic um, uh, uh, because a set of species were, uh, you know, it so happened to be at one place 
uh, and did not have the opportunity to uh, be in the other place. So it may have, for example, the 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 two mountains in the Nilgiris and Anamalais. Many of the analysis that we do looking at climate, it shows that the climates are actually very similar on these mountains. So presumably, if the bird figured out how to get around to the other island, uh, it may be able to exist there. I mean, if just hypothetically, I mean, it's perhaps possible. So it's not a specific adaptation per se. It's a limitation by various factors uh, of what, what happens in between. It's a combination of what is the barrier and the ecology of the species. So in some sense, the barrier is important, but so are the traits of the species in question. Wow. So this is yeah, some my barriers mind. are hard barriers and some are soft barriers. So it's, mm. it's uh, yeah. We did an episode about uh, Mauritius and certain birds are there in Reunion Island and not in Mauritius and it could have been very easy for them to cross. So in a way, it's the limitation of the bird's imagination that it doesn't even consider crossing the the barrier, yeah. isn't it? Birds biology, yeah. yeah. Various factors, yeah. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's exactly. so interesting. And another expert was telling us that the bar-headed geese that fly over the Himalayas, they don't really need to, but they had, they did it over as the mountain was forming and they just kept doing it. And now they're making this huge treks when they can fly in between. Again, it's yeah. uh, the way the bird has, it's really staggering how these... Amazing. Uh, so uh, the the last couple of questions is uh, uh, in Dr. Gadakkar's article, which we will link to. He mentions that you and your colleagues reorganized the songbird taxonomy of the Shola region. Can you talk about that, please? Yeah. So this is uh, not very complicated. It's just that once we had the genetic data, uh, we were not really looking to do much taxonomy. But uh, the fact was that we had we had all this genetic data. We were asking a set of questions, looking at uh, uh, the two different mountains. And then we realized that there's very little data from India. Uh, in fact, my data was one of the first from uh, you know the Western Ghats. So we had to kind of build a phylogeny, which looks at the relationships of birds with the other birds. Uh, and that's when, when we collaborated with Dr. Sushma Reddy at that time at Loyola University in Chicago. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we decided to uh, look at relationships with other birds and she had the data for several other birds. So we collaborated and we were able to kind of assess how these birds are different or are they the same as many others that we know today. Uh, so that, that was that, I, yeah. The last question which we ask all our guests is, uh, and please don't say I don't have favorites, but <laughs> please talk about some birds that resonate with you. And what are your some of your favorite bird species? <laughs> yeah. So the yeah, I think it's familiarity. So the the Sholikula and the laughing thrush are my clear favorites, uh, because uh, simply because I've been working with them for a while now. Uh, but the Nilgiri pipit, which is like this, you know, it's this mystery that I would like to solve, but uh, I'm not sure if I if I uh, uh, I've not been able to kind of get my hands on to it um, as as much as I would have liked. Uh, but so that's that's one of my favorites uh, today. Um, uh, yeah. What is the mystery that you would like to solve? Is it, uh, first of all, is it extinct? And uh, It's locally extinct, you could say. The numbers are really low in some places. Uh, we don't know how far these birds move. We know very little about the bird's ecology. Where does it nest? Where What does it eat? Why is it, uh, you know, not found in areas where there are other pipits that are found? Uh, so a lot of the species ecology is not known. Um, uh, and uh, I think if we have to think of how to conserve species, we need to understand their biology a lot better. Uh, if you think about it, why, why are we able to have a very good program to conserve the tiger? It's simply because it's one of the best studied species. We know a lot of individuals of tigers. We know, you know, I don't know, Machli or, you know, there are so many individual tigers that people know the ecologies of. They know how far they move. They've been radio tagging them and following them. And they know pedigrees of animals for a long time. So um, uh, very simply put, 
the more we know about a species, the better we can conserve it. Unfortunately, we know very little about most of our species. We know a little bit about many species. So that's uh, that's the challenge that we have. So I, I, I'm, I'm venturing that the Nilgiri pipit and the Sholikola and the laughing thrush are two, three birds that we can link to in this episode. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Robin, thank you so much for being part of the bird podcast. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. It's been great. Yeah. Bird Podcast is produced by Ullas Anand and Echo Edu. I'm Shobha Narayan. Thank you for listening.